Anugwitu. I'm Tori Johnston, and I'm Quinault from Tahola on the mouth of the Quinault River. I'm a self-taught guitarist, cat father, music theorist, fourth-year PhD student, and emerging musicologist examining the confluences between music, sound, nationhood, science, and technology. My family, the Chinus family, have all been lifelong residents of Tahola. My great-grandparents were Edwina and Daniel Chinus, and my aunties and grandma were Alice, Louise, Roseanne, and Edith. This generation of my family and the lands and waters we come from are my foundation for engaging intellectually with Native American and Indigenous studies. My immediate family are Kiwi Chinus, David Johnston, Tyson and Alyssa Johnston, Hazel Rhodes, River Jackson, and Novalis Chinus Jackson. We've all lived in Tahola and other places in what we now call Washington State. My siblings, mother, nieces, and nephew all live in or near Tahola and work for the tribe. I grew up on Snob Hill, just up from the tribal admin building. While you can't see my house in this picture, much of my life growing up was spent not only on the river, but at Tahola School, both pictured here. Tahola School is a K-12 institution with around 250 students when I was going there. My graduating class was relatively large at 13 students. In 2010, I moved from the village to Duwamish and Suquamish homelands, commonly known as Seattle. There, I studied American Indian studies as an attempt to bring some intellectual consonants into being. I felt more at home, away from home, in American Indian studies classes. Upon getting my BA in American Indian studies, I had a brief stint at home working for our Cobell land buyback program, but I really needed to leave the res. So I decided to move to Seattle, where I accepted a position at Seattle Indian Health Board's Youth Services Department. I was a project coordinator for an IHS-funded youth suicide prevention initiative. Recognizing my existential anxiety around the concept of growth and intellectual development, and inspired by my Chinese family legacy, I decided to pursue an MA in Native American Studies in Potwin Territory at UC Davis. My original plan was to get the MA and go to law school, particularly to practice in the environmental law and policy realm. While my first year of graduate study was wonderful and filled with opportunity, I felt a slight dissonance. Though the path that I was pursuing was admirable, and I might have even been suited to it, or at least capable, there was something that I was ignoring that came to light when I took Dr. Inez Hernandez Avila's NAS 254, or the Native Literature Graduate Seminar. Up to that point, I had been ignoring the musicality of my being, at least as it represents and occupies a significant part of my mind, body, and spirit. Knowing that we have at least one faculty in NAS that's a trained musicologist, I took this as a cosmic signaling and decided to change my career path to indigenous sound and music studies. I applied for the PhD program, completed my MA exam, and continued the work. Through my roots and routes, I find myself in Ohlone territory, based in San Francisco, where I play in a band called Dysfunctional, and plan on finishing out my coursework and qualifying exams in 2022. More than ever, music and sound have become my practical and theoretical home base. For my MPS project, I worked with the Quinault Indian Nation tribal members, aka some of my closest friends, in Tohola. My goal was to develop a community-based project that would emphasize Quinault-led, Quinault-centered musicking. The project was necessarily collaborative in principle and would be grounded in Quinault relationships to the community of Tahola, the broader hydrotopographic region of the Pacific Northwest coastline, and Quinault ways of knowing and being that have existed since time immemorial. By utilizing musicking as a methodology, my plan was to investigate the nexus between Quinault oralities, governance, and North Pacific lands and waters. The main outcomes of the project were ideally an aural archive of Quinault song and a set of protocols to bring together Quinault drummers and singers and Quinault government officials. The title of my summer project was Putting a Song on Top Tana, Quinault Musicking for Sound Protocols. I would like to bring attention to the phrase Quinault Musicking here, Utilizing Christopher Small's verbification of music into musicking, this phrase allows for the capaciousness of musicking as an activity rather than music being a thing or an object. Quinault musicking, then, relies on Quinaultness, which takes for granted that we are both Quinault and figuring out what that means simultaneously. 
Moving on to sound protocols, my intention was to ta challenge Deborah Kapchan's conception of sound knowledge as a non-discursive form of affective transmission by asserting Pacific Northwest native pro protocols, the ways in which we relate to ourselves, our communities, other communities, and more than human beings. Protocol carries the weight of many meanings from an ethic, a way of relating, and the noun by which native peoples describe the trading of embodied musicking practices and ceremony. Thus, sound protocols are discursive forms of affective transmission, and they are informed by our deep relationships to the lands and waters of the Pacific coast. What transpired over this past summer, in the fashion of much community-based research, was entirely different. We found that the instruments by which we would have practiced this thing called music were insufficient, at least in the short term, to the improvised desire of the development of a theory of quinault musicking. Instead of trying to produ produce an aural product that was meant to leverage my resources as an academic, my project partners and I, with whom I share the most honest relationships of anybody anywhere, engaged in deep, speculative, and resurgent theory crafting. Our conversations revolved around notions of place, relationality, quinaultness, and futurity. Before I continue with what we talked through pa this past summer, I would like to explain my reasoning behind the change in title for my project. The change from putting a song on to the songs remain on Taptana denotes a change in behavior and relationality on my part as a scholar in training. The simple fact is that there is no need to bring the songs to a place that's already singing. While I was at the ready to turn our conversations and ideas into recordings, my community partners and I decided that what we wanted to do was out of the scope of a single summer. While not conducive to a particular result, this method ended up being fruitful due to the ways in which we all brought our knowledge of sound and music into a distinctly Quinault context. My second big change is in the subtitle, Quinault Musicking for Sound Healing. This change engages a dense conversation around what healing means for Quinault and the broader context of indigenous peoples. While I do not want to dismiss the potential of sound protocols, the ways in which our sound sonic sovereignties can bring together the dimensions of the cultural and governance, sound healing is a more accurate descriptor for the main lesson that was learned this summer. Quinault musicking is a dense process of resurgent world making that defies the neoliberal therapeutic framework of indigenous healing. In other words, our songs, our sounds, our visits, and our stories are imbricated with the dimensions of governance, relationality, and hydrotopographical ways of knowing and being. Further, these processes are all integral to any notion of healing that will be meaningful for Quinault peoples. Among the first conversations I had with my project partners from back home was whether the word music was in the Quinault language. My friend and the main project partner for this project, Duane, informed me that there might be a word in the broader Coast Salish language group for louder, but to his knowledge, music is not present. While some, as history's musicologists have already done, might be quick to use this as a way of delegitimizing our engagement in musicking, Duane and I, and other Quinault members that I spoke to throughout the summer, prefer a more accurate framing one that comes from Quinault-specific observations of sonic phenomena, more specifically, the ways that we know and have come to know sound for thousands of years. In a Zoom meeting in preparation for this presentation, Duane told me that our relationships to musicking is not complex, but it is. I think that this sentiment does good work in describing the difficulties and paradoxes in trying to encapsulate and taxonomize a world sense a project that was integral to the development of imperial settler colonial institutions such as anthropology, musicology, and one could argue the broader university system in general. Duane and my connections to Quinaultness are at once universal to our community in the lands and waters that animate us, but also particular in our specific experiences as someone who is coded as a cultural leader and someone who left the res to pursue graduate study. This orientation of Quinaultness is incredibly dense. It recognizes the precedence of our ways of knowing and being, the layered temporalities of our ancestry and future generations, and the sovereignty that we practice despite settler colonial histories. Bringing us back to sound, the process of song making itself is a way of living, not simply a tool for commercial success and mere appreciation. 
The process of Quinault music making goes beyond Indian aesthetics, such as the drum, the flute, somber melodies, and purely spiritual practice. Their inclusion is something that we decide, not prescriptive of how Quinault sounds. Now that we have set the stage for our Quinault-specific theorizations of music making as a way of being, I would like to return to the hydrotopographical relationships that we have to the North Pacific coastline, or Taptana in the literal sense. Quinault ways of being simply would not be without our relationships to the lands and waters where we and our ancestors are from. While the sounds we make are certainly informed practically by ocean faring, fishing, and living in Tahola, there's an important and subtle distinction between articulating what Quinault did and will do practically and recognizing that our hydrotopographical relatives have just as much agency in sound as we do. This is a counter-hegemonic world sense that is animated through sacred responsibility to more than human kin. It is a pro process and orientation that is lifelong and animates all that we do, from governance to relating to one another, and of course, to musicking. It is important to note that what I call resurgent theory crafting was not some meeting session where we had primary texts to extract meaning from. Rather, it was spent visiting with one another, traveling to Seattle for the Seafair powwow, and of course, listening to music the whole time. Our summer playlist for 2022 included early 2000s emo music, power metal, progressive deathcore, a lot of rap and R&B, breakup songs, makeup songs, pop hits, and country tunes. While the invocation of these discrete genres ascribe a certain orientation towards music, one of consumption, I think that these songs shaped our conversations in meaningful ways, whether we were discussing music, indigeneity, colonialism, memory, or anything else. Beyond that, they also serve as our influences, the ways that we relate to this world called music, for better or for worse. And so, some of the best conversations this summer involved the process of Quinault musical speculation, the ways in which we ascertain genuine novelty through sounded practice. My friends and I had conversations about what we wanted Quinault music to be. These conversations included the state of some native music and its tendency towards the black and white in articulating native experiences. It included ideas for breakdowns that include Quinault drumming and singing in contrast and transition between two musical ideas. It included an overall gushing about Kendrick Lamar's ability to relay authentic experiences in a thoughtful and profound way and how we want to emulate that. And finally, it included a deep sense of Quinault being in sovereignty, whereby we get to decide how we sound to the rest of the world. And so, while this project did not turn out how I thought it would, it turned out exactly how it needed to as a Quinault person working at home. In our conversations with one another, through our musicking, through our deep and honest relationships, we articulated the integrity of sound as a form of Quinault knowledge production. Too often, we frame our healing under an appeal to individualistic therapeutic practices. But I think more than anything this summer, we learned that healing is at once never finished and densely capacious. It does not exclude musicking as a process. It does not exclude remixed temporalities between ancestors and future generations. It does not exclude sovereignty and governance on a nation scale. It is all of these intensely negotiated through the ways that we are resurging and persisting. <laughs>